Good afternoon. My name is Alex Fraser, and I'm producing director at Bucks County Playhouse. Welcome to Lambert Bill Hall. This is the Playhouse's Education Center just across the river from New Hope, Pennsylvania, where the Playhouse is in Lambertville, New Jersey. We're delighted today to be talking with Keir DeLay and Maya Dillon, who are starring in the Playhouse production of On Golden Pond by Ernest Thompson. Welcome, Kira and Maya, and thank, thank you so thank much you, for Alex. being with us today. It's a pleasure. This is the first time that we are um, trying a conversation with, I hope it becomes a series, and talking with um, artists who perform at the Playhouse about their work and about working at the Playhouse. Uh, and so we're excited to, um, to get going. So tell me about your first exposure to On Golden Pond. Well, my first exposure was having seen the film, but so long ago, I could barely remember the plot. I mean, I kind of vaguely remembered it, but for all practical purposes, working on the play was like it was a, a new play completely for me. And Maya? I was there opening night at the Hudson Guild in a little 80 seat theater where it had its very first performance. Wow, opening yeah. night, yeah. how fantastic is yeah. that? Why were you there opening night? Because I'd done six plays at uh, the Hudson Guild. I'm not sure I'd done all six by then, but I had done Da, which was my first Broadway play, which transferred from the Hudson Guild to Broadway, won four Tony Awards, um, and I think On Golden Pond was the next year, so that's why I was there. That's great. Kier had a nice conversation with our playwright, with Ernest Thompson, and I, I don't remember this because I just remember the play so clearly, and I loved it, but he said that Tennessee Williams was in the audience, sitting next to him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and was laughing convulsively throughout. Loved it. Wow. Loved Isn't it. that amazing? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing? So when you're approaching a role that you're familiar with or you may have seen before, does, does that influence you in any way? It's, it, yes, but basically you steal from the best. So <laughs> you steal what's useful and then make it your own. You, if it's, uh, I think Laurence Olivier always said that, steal from the best. Um, but you really bring your own sensibility and certainly with us being married, um, this is not our relationship but being married for 16 years, um, there are a lot of things that married couples um, just naturally in a relationship, there's a comfort level that I think we bring to the play that you can love somebody at the same time that you want to kill them. And when he several times during the play says, I think you're trying to kill me. And I say, I've thought about it. <laughs> From my point of view, since I hardly had remembered the film, I think it was an advantage. I didn't have to come in with preconceived ideas, but could start kind of exploring from scratch. And with the help of Johnny Silverstein, who is a great director, uh, who pointed the way and was very helpful, because the, the character is very different than, than I am in real life. I mean, he's a, a much... Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of fun. I mean, it's sort of like when you, yeah. when you play a villain, for example, not that this man is a villain, anything but, but just, just to choose an overt example, if you play a villain, you don't try to find the evilness, you find what it is you like about the villain. If you're gonna play Iago, you can't, you know, uh, quietly and uh, underneath it all kind of decide he's a horrible person. You have to find all the reasons why you like him. And that's the way you make a character come alive uh, so you don't get some kind of cut out version. Uh, of it. So um, it's been an interesting journey to explore someone who is as different as Norman is for me. It's been fun. That's always a challenge in, in, in a play. It's interesting that you say that because it reminds me that I find that the actors who are known for playing the most evil characters, the most villainous characters, are always the most charming, delightful, <laughs> wonderful people, as are you. And I think that is a, um, a very same thing. And the converse, often those who play the sweetest, most wonderful characters <laughs> are not. Yeah. And I think it's very interesting how that dichotomy of being yeah. very different from the characters that you play 
Do you, do you think Ethel is close to you, Maya? Do you find a lot about her that is familiar? No, she has a lot more energy than I have. That whole first scene where I am, I'm, you know, setting up the whole set, you know, rolling out the rugs, taking up the, uh, oh my God, no. Ethel has a lot more energy than I have. Um, I think Ethel is far more optimistic than I am. I'm not a pessimist, but she has a, I wish I had her sunny side where she's always looking on the bright side and always looking for um, the, the good in every situation. Uh, when we were in rehearsals, Johnny said to me, um, our director, um, he was, he wondered why I tell that story about um, the red scooter that, you know, I wanted for my fourth birthday. And I say, um, my father told me I couldn't have one. Um, and he said I'd understand when I was older. And I say, I'm a lot older now, and I'm afraid I still don't understand. But he gave me Elmer, my doll. And Elmer and I became the best of friends. That contrast, and I realized, just as I'm doing it, I, the reason it's in the play, I think, is that's the contrast between Ethel and her daughter, is that Ethel wanted that red scooter, but she was happy to have the doll that she got instead. And that doll became her best friend. How interesting And is I that? say to my daughter, you know, don't you think everyone looks back at her childhood with some bitterness and regret about something? And that, to me, that's the bitterness and regret, was that I didn't get that red scooter, but it didn't ruin my life. And I think that's her big message to her daughter is, you take what life gives you, and you make the most of it. And you can't keep hashing over what didn't happen and what you didn't get. I think that's one of the things that impresses me most about this play and now watching it many times. There's nothing gratuitous in that play. No. Everything that is in there, there's a purpose, there's a reason, there's a foreshadowing. You know, it's so interesting, the medications delivered early in the play, just to make sure that the idea of the medic, I mean, everything yeah. in the play really comes home to roost yeah. in, in an extraordinary way. What was it? What did you discover about the play? Well, you don't have a, a strong memory of it. What did you discover about the play? What was the most interesting thing that has been revealed to you through the performance and rehearsal of the play? I did not remember, because this was a long time ago. This was 1979. Seems uh, like only yesterday. <laughs> I remember it being funny. I don't remember the depth of this play and and of course when I was watching it in 1979 I was in my 20s so I was not relating to these old people on stage I just laughed ha 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 I, this play deals with a lot of important issues to people who are facing getting older and you know what might happen if you lose your partner and uh, it, those, those are the things that resonate now, which are beautifully explored in this play. Yeah. Norman is, my character Norman is consumed by Gallo's humor and, and the fact that he's reaching 80. He starts, he's 79 as the play opens and has his 80th birthday during the course of the play. And I'm uh, very close to the age of this character. The difference is that Norman is consumed with thoughts of his own demise including his humor. His humor is so tied in with, that's why I say it's gallows humor. Uh, but there's no way of reaching my age that you don't start thinking, you know, there isn't that much time left. I'm in good health, fortunately, and I'm doing pretty well given how old I am. But nonetheless, there are those thoughts. So, you know, I think of the, her the human personality, uh, this is true for anyone, but this is the actor's job is to choose which color out of the rainbow works for that role. We're, we all have red, blue, green, and all the other colors of the rainbow. Some of us have a stronger red. You might have a stronger blue. She might have a stronger orange. But we have those colors. And it's up to us as actors to decide which color is the main color for that character. And then to go inside yourself and find that aspect, 
even if it's not as strong a color in yourself as it is in the character, and concentrate on that. So that's kind of the job that we have. I'm just very happy, unlike Norman, who is a real grump and a grouch, <laughs> Kier wakes up happy every morning. So. That's a great gift. It is. That is it a great is. gift. And the other thing I mentioned, because you alluded it at the beginning of our, our conversation, and that is the advantage of working with one's wife or some friend that you've had, people that you've worked with before, is that normally you're cast in a play and you meet the rest of your cast members on that first day, and it's a little bit of shadow boxing. You're not, you we are all a little bit, how, how are we going to get along? A little defensive. Whereas when you either are married to your p partner on stage or have worked together many times, which I have, for example, with Elizabeth Ashley, I've worked with her for about, n with about nine times, you're so ahead of the game. You don't have to go through that shadow boxing period where you're trying to say, is this person going to trip me up or not, or are we going to get along? That's gone. That's, you're so far ahead. And given the fact we only had two weeks rehearsal, that, went a, that was very important. I just have to say that I saw you all do Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, speaking of Elizabeth Ashley, um, two years ago in Provincetown, and extraordinary performances in an extraordinary play. And I know that you, had you ever done the play before? No, Cat on a Hot Tin no. Roof? Huh. Um, but you, of course, famously starred opposite Elizabeth Ashley in the Broadway revival. Um, uh, in 1974. 1974. Playing The Sun. And so what was it like approaching a different part in the same play, playing was, your, your own father? It, in was a a, 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 it was a magical experience because um, in the production I did with Elizabeth, uh, Fred Gwynn played Big Daddy. Fred Gwynn was quite brilliant. Um, I, I happen to think, I think his performance was even better than Burl Ives, who created the role. And my first Broadway play was with Burl Ives, so I, I, I know I had the experience of working with an actor, which was fine. He was a good actor, but Fred Grin was special in this role. And so when I came to this role, never thinking I would ever be cast in it, I'm not obvious casting for B Big Daddy, but I so admired what Fred did that I, my says, you shouldn't mention this too often, because it's going to sound like you're not doing the performance yourself. Well, I, I did do the performance myself, but emotionally I channeled Fred Gwynn. And I grew a very large beard. Why? Because he had one. And I also did a voice. I, I, I played the whole role way down here. <laughs> and that's because Fred Gwynn's voice was way down there. I'd never done a role like that before with that voice. So it was a magical experience. I almost felt like his spirit came down and entered my body, and I just walked out, and there it was. It was yeah. a remarkable experience. Yeah. I know I said this before, but it's so similar. Rosemary Harris, who'd originally played the daughter in um, oh. The Royal yeah. Family on Broadway, did the Broadway revival and played the, her own mother in, in oh. an effect. And I think hmm. at first she said she couldn't do it. The memory of Ava Le Gallienne was so extraordinary in her mind. and. Um, uh, she finally was persuaded by Ann Kaufman, and it was a beautiful performance. And she said it was a tribute. All she could well, do is offer it up as a tribute that's, to that's, what that's came a, That's a good word. That's, I wish I'd use it, it. It was a tribute to Fred. Yeah. 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 So I'm so curious, and I'm sure this question has been asked so many times, but you have gone back and forth between film and theater so much of your career. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious what brings you back to the theater. And I applaud you for coming back as often as you do, because we lose so many well, and who go and don't come back. Because the idea of eight perform they'd rather sit in a trailer than do eight performances a week, which I don't understand. But, <laughs> but, but how do you find it? And what brings you back to the theater? There's a, well, there's a cliche that I've made up. And it's oversimplified, because I've had wonderful experiences in film. However, uh, the cliche is that uh, theater pays the soul and film pays the pocketbook. Now, that's, having said that, I've had wonderful experiences in film, but there's something about, I started doing theater in junior high and uh, then high school, right near where we're, 
where we're playing this play at the George School in Newtown, Pennsylvania, which isn't very far away. And they had a remarkable drama program for a, for a, for a high school level. It was, you could take it as a half unit subject. And we did Galsworthy and Shaw and Saroyan wow, and that wow. did acting exercise. And I have no question that the seed was, I didn't realize it then. Because I thought, I mean, who, who would pay you to have so much fun? It, so it didn't occur to me to make, make a profession out of it. But I know, looking back, that that's where the seed was planted. And that was live theater. And my early experiences professionally with all live theater, there is nothing can match the experience of a, a li of a live audience. There's something palpable, even in silent scenes. I like to describe the experiment. With, with the comedy, it's obvious, because you hear the laughs. But even in very serious scenes, there's something that I call the roar of silence that you feel. Oh. The, the silences differ from night to night. And you know, every performance, you're trying to get it right all over again. You, you, know, you try not to imitate. You try to recreate each night something you found before, but maybe you find it a little different. Whereas you know, film, it's, it's one take. I mean, you, do, may, may, you may do a number of takes, but the editor's going to choose one of them. So it's like the, same, the exact same performance all the time, every time you see the movie. Do you ever watch your films? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, oh that's good, because sure. most, most performers I know, when you ask, like I always tease, I teased Marsha Mason that we were going to make her sit through a Marsha Mason film festival when she was here. And she was like, the worst nightmare of hell would be to have to sit through all of her films. <laughs> well, I'm always curious to see how well, how much I've achieved that I felt that I was doing at the time. It's a learning experience to see yourself in, in, in film. And, you know, I'm, I have had occasions which, where I wish that I hadn't. Uh, not too often, but I remember there's a film I did. Uh, John Huston was in it. Um, it was called Desaad, in which I played the Marquis de Sade. Uh, it was filmed in Germany. And I made the mistake of going to a film premiere in New York with a red carpet without having seen a private screening first. Uh -oh. I think I would have made my excuses. So anyway, uh, all I can tell you is the review, in, I don't know if you remember a critic by the name of Wanda Hale. She was the... Yeah. She was the first critic to use stars, one, two, three, uh. or four. Nobody else had done that until, and she was the critic for the New York News back then. This would have been in the 60s. But she started, well, she was way before the 60s, uh, the 40s and 50s and into the 60s. And her review of the film described sitting behind Keir DeLay as he got lower and lower and lower <laughs> in his seat. Does that tell you how I felt about the film? <laughs> Oh, that's funny. So speaking of Bucks County, how, Maya, how do you find the audiences here? You haven't had so many because we're all, you're only in, I think, right. your fifth performance. But so far, how would you describe it? It's been wonderful. That? And I have been stopped on the street because this is, this is a wonderful little town. Oh, I, this is the most charming location for a theater. Uh, right here on the river, it's gorgeous. Um, but I've been stopped on the street by people our age, and by uh, d teenagers, 20-year-olds, who have stopped me to say, hey, I loved your play. Oh, <laughs> how great is that? Yeah, tell yeah. them a story about somebody who was sitting next to an older group of people. Oh, well, It's a funny story. You tell it. Oh, uh, there were some people sitting actually behind some friends of mine for the Sunday matinee who were complaining before the show started, saying, I don't want to see a play about old people. And they were old. Um, they were uh, age appropriate. And they were saying, well, we don't have to stay. You know, if we, 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 can, always we, walk we can always leave at the, at the intermission. We don't have to stay. Well, apparently, they not only stayed, they loved it. So. Well, I have to yeah. say, we have a, a younger staff member who came to see it a little bit, kind of like, I'll make it through the first act. Yeah. And he came up afterwards and just said, I have to say, and told me I kind of came tre trepidatious, and yeah. I just loved it. And he's not a theater person, so it was like a really uh, strong endorsement, I think, for your performances well, and for you. the whole cast and the play. The play itself yeah. holds up yes, just it does. beautifully. It's not dated at all. I don't think so. I think this is a universal play about human relationships. Um, we just have another couple of minutes. Uh, and so I just want to, um, 
I, the audience is so interesting to me. It's the one thing you don't have in film and television. And I'm just wondering, in your first few performances, what, is, what have they taught you about your performances or the play? Our director, Johnny Silverstein, has the greatest laugh I've ever heard. Uh, the character Charlie in the play, who's famous for his laugh, has nothing on Johnny. He <laughs> laughs. True. He's the best audience. Uh, but he tends to laugh at different things than the audience. I mean, they overlap, but um, the audience is laughing at somewhat different places. So it's... Um, the audience teaches you how to pace the play. I mean, Johnny paced the play, but the audience is the last, it's always the last character when you're doing live theater. And they have taught us where, um, where, the, la you know, where, the, where, laughs where the laughs are, and because I it's a very funny play, but also y you can feel where the audience is with you and where, um, th in the scene with Krista, when I, Slap her, um, that gasp. Um, the, and I asked someone, you know, what, mo what are the most moving parts of the play? Because I'm thinking it's, I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it, but in the last scene when there's some medical issues. Um, but I asked someone, I, I actually I think it may have been Johnny, what, 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 are, what are the tugs at the heartstrings of the audience? And he said that scene with my daughter and also the kiss with Norman and Ethel. There's something about, the thing I love about that slap is that, and is that, I shouldn't say this, but is that in the script? Yes, or, yes it's in okay. the script. Um, and it says, but it says, if the actors feel brave enough, right. that I could slap the table if I didn't feel brave enough to slap her. But, right. Right. Um, Krista said, "Go for it," and but, I think it's important. But what's for that so wonderful scene. about it is the is the ca Ethel immediately regrets it, and and yeah. the warmth and love that comes from her immediately after that slap is so palpable, and it's really a beautiful scene. There are yeah. so many beautiful it's scenes. It's good writing. In the play. Uh, it's no wonder Tennessee Williams complimented him and. Um, basically was telling him he's passing the mantle on to... Yes, he did. He said yeah. that to him. Wow. Yeah. I'll give you another, an example of learning, just a quick laugh that the, the audience uh, taught me, it, uh, has taught me, that works. Uh, the play, in the play, it, 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 there you, I have an encounter with my daughter's new boyfriend, whom she eventually marries. And I kind of, he's a dentist, and I rake him over the coals at a certain point, and it, like, kind of interrogating him. And uh, so at the very end of the play, uh, Ethel, my wife, Maya, is on the phone with uh, her daughter. And, and uh, but, oh no, she's on the phone with this dentist, whose name is Bill. And, and she says, who is this? Because at first, I don't know who, it's on. I, I answer the phone, and I start saying, I'm fine, how are you? And I have no idea who it is. And I finally say, who is this? And he says, I say, oh, Bill, it's Bill. So my lines as written are, Bill? Oh, Bill. So Johnny, our director, said, when you finally realize which Bill it is, turn to the chair where I haven't given him a hard time. Ah. And well, he laughed every time I did it in rehearsal. Didn't get a laugh at all from any audience. That moment did not. Maya gave me this idea of trying it, and it's working. I'm now going, Bill? Oh, Bill. <laughs> because I have a moment in the play where I say, want to see my teeth? That's great. That's wonderful. So That's we discovered great. the audience laughs, so we know it works. Yeah. So in our last minute, I have to say, as I was thinking of questions, and now I haven't needed any of them. You all are such natural conversationalists. but. I was I I thought well what did James Lipton ask people on the um, inside the actor studio which I'm afraid I've never seen even one episode but oh, I thought good. but but I hate those questions but he asked the Proust <laughs> questions at the end and right. I thought well I'm not going to do that but I am curious in our final moments yeah what role have you not played that you would most like to play? And are there roles that you haven't done together that you would like to do? I'd love to do Katahati and Roof again. 
it, it was such a short, when you do, and maybe I'd love to do On Golden Pond again, when you do it for three weeks, you know, I, when I started in this business, doing Da, I did it for a year on Broadway, and Crimes of the Heart, again, I did it for a year, and there's something fabulous about, you can only do it with good material, but both of those plays are brilliant plays, and just, and just, being able to dig deeper and deeper and make discoveries over the months. Yes. There's something so fulfilling about that. Um, I, I can think of roles that now I can't play because I'm beyond the age. You know, oh, I don't think that, that counts. I don't think oh, that counts. No, well, I love Chekhov, and, and I would have liked to have done Sonia in Uncle Vanya, but I aged out, so... I guess I'll have to do uh, the mother then. <laughs> you did Three Sisters. I sure did. Directed by Lynn Meadow. Yes, I, I did. I was there. Maya and I worked yeah. together several times at a great distance, but still early in our careers. And I'm just remembering. Yeah. Who were the other two sisters? Diane Weiss. Diane Weiss and oh. Lisa Baines. Lisa Baines. Yeah. Lisa Baines. That was and a great Jeff production. And Jeff Daniels was Andre. Wow. Yeah. And see. Sam Waterston was uh, Vershina. What a cast. It yeah. was a great what cast. What a great cast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On East 73rd Street. Yeah. How about you, Kier? Well, it sounds like I'm not a very original person, but I got to tell you, I agree with Maya. I feel. I would love to do, get to do Big Daddy again because we, we how long did we do? I don't think we had well, as long as we do it, here. Well, did we, we did it at the Watt Theater, the Wellfleet oh, okay. well Harbor Actors Theater is yeah. where it started. So we did have On three the weeks. We had yeah. three weeks there and then we had one week at the Tennessee Williams Theater Festival in Provincetown. So we did get to do it for a month. Um, but, but you know, getting a taste of it. Oh, it's such it's a rich play fun. and that, I mean, I would give anything. To, to, to we had do such a, big a fabulous again. company yeah, and was, a fabulous director. Um, yeah, in fact, Elizabeth is coming to see the show next week. Yeah, our oh, director is coming. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Elizabeth Falk. Great. And well, that's our bell. That's so our we bell. are out of time. Thank you both so oh. much thank for you. being here and sharing this with us. And thank yeah. all of you and to our HowlRound crew. Thank you so much. Hey. We're good. Great. How easy is that? Yeah. Y'all are so easy. Well, you're, you have great ease, too. You're your... easy. That was so much fun. <laughs>